This is the first Sunday of Advent. And every preacher I know loves to say this on the first Sunday of Advent. Happy New Year! And to which some people go, wait a minute, it's not January 1st! And that's when we get to remind you that in our church year, it begins on the first Sunday of Advent. And now we are going to hear scripture this year from the Gospel according to Matthew. But oddly enough, we are not disconnected at all from where we have been. For if we remember correctly, the last two to three weeks of scripture that bring us to this moment have been apocalyptic scripture. Christ the King and before, reminding us of what we hear Jesus speaking about on this day. Those who have chosen what we hear for this day hear Jesus saying, you better be ready. You know not when the Master will come. We will hear this evidenced um, in the blessing at the end of our Eucharist that we may be as prepared for his second advent as we are for his first, which is the incarnation, which is what we will celebrate at Christmas. And then that leads us to the crucifixion and then to the resurrection. All of this reminds us about the light coming into the world. This is the light that the prophet Isaiah at the very beginning of his prophecies is speaking about. This is the light. This is the light that a world that is faced with darkness is desperately seeking. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says it so well. For salvation is nearer to us than now when we became believers. The night is foregone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now, in the spirit of a new year, we have a collect of the day. That's one of the long prayers at the beginning of our worship that frames what we are remembering from the scripture for today. But since it's also a collect for the first Sunday of Advent, the first Sunday of our new year, it really is a marvelous summation of how we ought to look at the whole coming year. And if you listen to it, you'll hear something that you've already heard. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light so that in this time of mortal life in which your son Jesus came to visit us in great humility, we can meet him in much the same way. So what is it for us to think about this darkness? So I'm going to give you a $50 word. You all ready for your $50 word? You can take this home and share it with all your friends. Tell them you got it in church. Hyperbolic. That's a $50 word. Hyperbolic really means prone to excessive exaggeration. But when you put bodily imagery into it, hyperbolic, it sounds an awful lot like the way the world communicates today. With so much stuff coming at us at all moments, at all times. I was um, in a shopping mall yesterday, um, and I had to thread my way through the crowd carefully because nobody was looking out for anybody else. I couldn't get over the number of people that were walking around with an electronic device in their hands, walking through, and you had to... They needed to be so connected to every piece of information that was popping and floating through that. Email, articles, videos, football games, tweets, you name it. That's what I mean by hyperbolic. Hyperbolic in the information age, when we are soaking it all in, whether it's good information or not so useful information, sometimes seen as fake news or whatever it is, there's enough coming at us at all times. Wouldn't it be nice to have some armor on to protect us from it? So what would constitute a form of the armor of light to help us with this 
power of darkness that I'm now articulating as stuff coming at us all the time, this hyperbolic sense. Well, I would um, bring you in to what happened in this very building on Tuesday evening. On Tuesday evening, we were the host for the Bayshore Ministerium's Interfaith Thanksgiving Celebration. And that meant we had people from across all faiths literally in this place. We had a Sikh who was up with us in the clergy. Um, we had um, the youth minister from the Muslim congregation, which is up on Red Hill. And about 30 members of that congregation were here, teenagers, women, men. It was amazing that they came out. We had about 100 people here for worship. A Unitarian Universalist minister was speaking as well and offering a prayer. We had a rabbi. We had members of his congregation. Various members of various other groups, Christian groups were here as well. It was an amazing mosaic, an amazing tapestry. And I had the privilege of standing here as I do now, not dressed as I am now, not using the imagery that I would use with you to try to find a way to bring a message across. And I've discovered that kind of what I said then still has meaning today because I brought in something, I brought in, no surprise, the rule of St. Benedict. I mean, how many times have you heard me bring in the rule of St. Benedict? In that light, I was using it to help get us ready for the difference between a spirit of thanksgiving, which John McQuisden used, a late Episcopal layperson, in his first rendition of the rule of St. Benedict, to where he changed it to a, uh, live with an attitude, a spirit of loving kindness. And then I worked from there to Micah 6, 8, which is do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Don't lose that. That's still very important. But in bringing the rule of St. Benedict in, it's interesting for us to remember that the rule of St. Benedict is about 1,600 years old, written for life in community. So I thought the rule could work well across all faith groups that basically say love is what binds us together. Love is what defines God for us, our response to that love. And then I began to realize post that evening as I got ready for this morning that when the rule of St. Benedict was created around 500, 600 AD, we were just beginning in Western Europe to approach and become part of what was known as the Dark Ages. The Roman Empire has disintegrated. Feudalism is coming into play. The more powerful lords becoming kings or having vassals. Uh, people are basically worthless and the only place they can find safety is behind stone walls if they're lucky. And learning, not needed when power is going to rule. So I have this connection to the monasteries behind their stone walls holding on to a number of essentials that make it possible for us to remember what it takes in our own day, our own hyperbolic day, to put on the armor of light. In the monasteries of that time and beyond, they cultivated knowledge. They copied the books. They celebrated. That was the repository of knowledge. They were also the place where a traveler could stop and safely stay the night and receive a meal. The monasteries of that time took in and were the hospitals and took care of the poor and the infirm. All because they valued stability, obedience, and conversatio morum. The essentials of what it means to have a discipline that builds humility and helps you understand what it means to push back the darkness in the power of the light, the light that we have found in Jesus Christ. So stability, just please remember, means sticking with it. Obedience simply means to listen. Obedier is the root word, one who listens, one who hears, listening carefully to God and one another. And conversatio morum is daily improvement. 
Can we get better at it every day? I also was thinking about, as I was trying to ponder, what would be a good New Year's resolution to have going into Advent? You think about it, when everything is coming at us, uh, I could recommend you read Albert Holtz's, he's a Benedictine monk's book, From Holidays to Holy Days. It's a series of meditations on dealing with Christmas. Very powerful and wonderful book. As a matter of fact, our Tuesday Ladies group is reading it right now. Is there something from my own experience that could give you an insight as to how hard it is to try to find something that embraces a discipline to push back the darkness? The darkness that our hyperbolic world right now is just so placing on us. And I was thinking about what it was like to interact with all the folks Tuesday night in the Undercroft when some of our friends from the Muslim community were saying to us, we feel so welcome. And then to watch their teens act like any group of teens I've ever been with. And they were fabulous, and they helped clean up too. They were great. And I remembered that the women, because of the nature of their faith, they wore headscarves. They chose to wear them as an outward mark of their faith journey. I would think that each and every one of us might find something that publicly could declare us a Christian. Where do we stand? So think of a headscarf. And in our hyperbolic world, and where the darkness creeps in, the headscarves have become real hard to understand, especially in an area here that 15 years ago, we all understand what it means to take a group and lay this at their feet as if they're the force of darkness when maybe the individuals that we've met are not. How do we find a way to move from the group to the people, which is what we'd want anyway? And I remembered something I learned from reading Diana Butler Bass. I can't remember which one of her books I read it in, but it's become a part of my own understanding of how to deal with when the world wants me to think of something one way, maybe I can fight back and put on the armor of light inside me, whether I say it out loud or not. And she was asked by a five-year-old, it might have been her daughter or a granddaughter, I don't remember the story per se, you know, why that woman, pointing to somebody who was of a Muslim tradition, wore a headscarf. And Diana Butler Bass had to ponder it and deal with her own emotions and her own feelings, and then she said, I came up with an explanation. I said, whenever I see a woman like that, I'm going to tell myself, there's a woman who loves God. There's a woman who loves God. So the armor of light is an internal discipline which helps us look at the world through the love we've received in Jesus Christ in such a way that we can see the commonplace and then see the holy. This is how we can push back against the darkness. And if we're worried about being ready for when the master comes again, you know not when the master will come, but if the thief came in the middle of the night, wouldn't you be ready for him? All right? Well, I would think that embracing the work of a discipline like this, and you can pick any group and fill in the blank and begin to figure out how you can re-educate yourself against what the world might claim about somebody or even a family member when you're looking for some level of healing from within your own grouping. The armor of light will give you the strength because we are going to find it in that light of Christ. The light that we celebrate in the incarnation, we remember not being snuffed out at the crucifixion and we celebrate with great joy and know as part of our lives from the resurrection. So if we live our lives with a discipline of sticking with it, 
sticking with what we understand is where that light comes from, listening carefully for the guidance that comes from God through the voices of those who surround us, helping to push away the voices that would pull us away from the goodness of the light, and then trying to get better at embracing and sharing the light, then maybe we'll find just enough humility that when Jesus comes in his great glory at his second advent, we will truly be prepared to receive him and be embraced because by sharing a little slice of heaven now, when heaven is offered, we'll simply slide right in. All these words I offer in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.